I remembered Jim's description of the woman who made her. How could a woman like that make a beautiful doll? My name is Stephen Amini, and I am a doctor. I live and work in London, and I have a house by the River Thames. Everything in this story happened because of a doll. It is a strange story, but true. It began on an October day three years ago. I can remember it clearly. The early morning sun was shining on the river when I left my house. I went to buy a copy of the Times as usual. There was a flower shop on the corner of the road where I lived. I could see the brightly coloured flowers as I reached the corner. I turned into Abbey Lane and continued walking. I was enjoying the warm October sun. After a few minutes, I arrived at the newspaper shop. Suddenly, I remembered that it was a niece's birthday the next week, so I stopped and looked in the shop window. There were games and toys, paper and pens, books and sweets in the window. Most of it has been in that window for years. I thought to myself. I almost decided that there was nothing in the window for my niece. Then, I saw a doll. She was half hidden in the corner of the window. She was made of cloth, and she had a painted face. The face was special. It had a lovely, gentle look, but sad eyes. Suddenly, I felt sorry for her. Sitting in that crowded window, I know that this sounds strange, but I decided to go inside and to look at her more closely. The shop was owned by a man named Jim Carter. Good morning, Doctor Amony," he said brightly when I walked in. "Do you want the Times as usual?" "Yes, please, Jim," I replied. And I need a present for a little girl. It's her birthday next week. Is it? Said Jim. Yes, I said. I was looking at that cloth doll in your window. Oh, said Jim. The one that's half hidden in the corner. I said. Jim looked surprised. That doll, he said. She's a little unusual. Can I see her? I said. She's also very expensive, he said. He took the doll from the window and gave her to me, and I nearly dropped her in surprise. She was beautifully made. She seemed almost alive. Her dress. And other clothes were handmade, not made by a machine, and her face was hand painted. I could see it clearly now. She's lovely, I thought. She was made with a lot of love. I could see this love in the doll's face. I put her down gently. How much do you want for her, Jim? I asked. Twelve pounds, Doctor Amony," he answered. He saw the surprise in my face and continued, "She's expensive. I did say that, didn't I?" "You did," I agreed. "Dolls like this cost as much as twenty pounds in the centre of London," said Jim. "But, but I'll tell you what I'll do, Doctor." I'll sell her to you for eleven pounds. Who makes them? I asked. I'd like to know something about the person who can make beautiful dolls like this. The woman has lived in Hardley Street for some years now," said Jim. She sometimes comes into my shop, and she brings me the dolls. What's her name? 
I asked. I'm not sure, Jim answered. It's something like Callamy. What's she like? I said. She's a tall woman with red hair, and she wears very expensive coats and hats. Replied Jim. But she's got a very serious face. She never says very much when she comes into the shop. I'm honestly always glad when she leaves. He stopped for a minute, and then said, "And I've never seen her smile." I couldn't understand this. How could a woman like that make dolls as beautiful as these? I'll buy the doll," I said at last. Eleven pounds seemed a lot of money for a doll. As I counted out the pound notes, I felt a little silly. Yes, the doll was a present, but I knew the real reason for buying her. I didn't want to leave her in that shop window. I took the doll home. And put her in my small bedroom. She seemed to fill the room with her loveliness. I carefully put her into a box. Then I covered the box with brown paper. Later in the afternoon, I went to the post office and posted it to my niece. In the following days, I could not stop thinking about the doll. Or about the gentle face and the sad eyes. I remembered Jim's description of the woman who made her. How could a woman like that make a beautiful doll? It was difficult to believe. So who was she? I wanted to know, but the weather got cold and wet. Children in the area became ill. And I was suddenly very busy. I soon forgot about the woman, and the doll. One day, a few weeks later, my telephone rang. A woman's voice said, "Is that Doctor Amony?" "Yes, it is," I said. "Do you visit people who can pay for your visit?" The woman asked. "Yes, sometimes." I replied, "How much does it cost?" She asked. The voice sounded unpleasant. The woman seemed to think that money was more important than the sick person. A visit will cost five pounds. I replied. "Oh," she said. "But if you really can't pay, then I don't ask for the money." I said. That's all right," she said. "I can pay five pounds." "What's your name?" I asked. "Rose Calamit," she answered. "I live in the house next to the cake shop in Hardley Street. My rooms are on the second floor. I'll be there soon," I told her. I arrived at the house next to the cake shop in Hardley Street. Ten minutes later, and went up the stairs. They were narrow, dirty, and badly lit. As I reached the top of the stairs, a door opened. "Doctor Amony," said the unpleasant voice. "Yes," I said. "Please come in," she said. "I'm Rose Calamit." She was a tall woman. Between forty-five and fifty years old, she had red hair, dark eyes, and a bright, shiny red mouth. We went into the front room. It was a cold, ugly room, and the furniture was cheap and badly made. On the cupboard in the corner were a lot of small glass bottles. Then I saw the dolls. They were hanging from the walls, and were thrown carelessly across the bed. Each doll was different, but each one 
was as beautiful as my doll. It seemed impossible that this rough, unpleasant woman could make them. Rose Calumet looked closely at me. "You're a very young doctor," she said. "I'm older than I look," I said coldly. "You think that I'm too young. Shall I go away again?" She laughed at me. "You don't need to be angry, doctor," she said. "You're very good-looking for a doctor." And I'm a very busy doctor," I said. "Are you the person who's ill?" "No, it's my niece," she replied. "She's in the back room. I'll take you to her." Before we went in, I had to know about the dolls. "Do you make these dolls?" I asked. "Yes," she replied. "Why?" I felt very sad. Oh, I bought one for someone's birthday. I said quietly. She laughed. And I'm sure that you paid a lot of money for it, she said. She took me to a smaller room at the back, and started to open the door. Mary, it's the doctor, she shouted. Then she pushed the door open wider to let me in. "Don't be surprised when you see her, doctor," she said loudly. "Her left leg is twisted." The girl, Mary, was sitting in a chair by the window. She heard the woman's words. A look of unhappiness crossed her pale face, and there was pain in her large dark eyes. I was angry at the red-haired woman. The words were unnecessary. She wanted to hurt the girl. Mary was not more than twenty-five years old, but I could see immediately that she was very ill. I looked again into those dark eyes. Something inside her is dying. I thought. After that first visit. I always remembered the sweetness in her sad face, her poor, thin body, and her dry, unhealthy hair. But something filled me with happiness. Around her were three small tables, and on them were all the necessary things to make the dolls: brightly coloured paints and pieces of cloth of many different colours and shapes. I soon understood that her twisted leg was not the reason for her illness. I noticed the way that she sat. If I was right, I could make that leg straight. I was almost sure that I was right. Can you walk, Mary? I asked after a minute. She looked at me, then looked away. Yes. She answered quietly. "Please walk to me," I said gently. "Oh, don't," she said. "Don't ask me that." I didn't want her to suffer, but I had to be sure that I was right. "I'm sorry, Mary," I said. "Please try and walk. It's important." She got up from her chair very carefully. And moved slowly towards me. I looked closely at her left leg. Yes, I was right. That's good, I said. I smiled at her. I wanted to show her that I was pleased. I held out my hands to help her. She looked up. Again, I saw the pain and hopelessness in her face. She seemed to be crying out silently to me for help. She lifted her hands towards mine, and then they fell back to her sides. How long have you been like this, Mary? I asked. Rose Calumet answered for the girl. 
Oh, Mary's had that twisted leg for nearly ten years now, she said. But I asked you to come for a different reason. She's ill. I want to know what's wrong with her. Oh, yes, she's ill, I thought. Perhaps she's dying. I knew that immediately. I wanted Rose Calumet to leave the room, but she didn't. She laughed and said, <laughs> I'm staying here, Dr. Amony. You look at Mary, then you can tell me what the problem is. When I finished my examination of Mary, I went with Rose into the front room. It's possible to make her legs straight, I said. Did you know that? With help, she could walk in... Stop! She shouted loudly. I jumped. That's enough. You must never say anything about that to her. The best doctors cannot help her. No stupid young man is going to give her hope. If you ever do, you won't come here again. I want to know what's wrong with her. She can't eat or sleep, and she isn't really working. Now tell me, what did you learn from your examination of her? I don't know what's wrong with her yet, I replied. But something is slowly destroying her, I know that. I shall want to see her again soon. I'm going to give her some medicine. It will make her feel stronger. Then I'll call again in a few days. Don't say anything about making her legs straight, she said. Do you understand? If you do, I'll get another doctor. All right, I said. I wanted to be able to visit Mary again. And I thought to myself, perhaps when Mary's feeling better, I can talk to her about her leg. I was ready to leave. I picked up my bag. These dolls, I said. Yes, she said. I thought that you made them, I said. I do, she said in her unpleasant way. I draw them. Mary makes them. It stops her thinking about her leg. I don't want her to think about the fact that she'll never marry. She'll never have children. I walked out into the bright October sunshine. I knew that Rose Calumet was lying. I now knew the sweet person who made those special dolls. I was happy about this, but I was also worried about Mary. I had to discover... What was wrong with her? I had to know before she died.